Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Som TV Podcast. My name is Jason Wise. This month, the month of March, we are doing a very, very special offer that if you subscribe to Som TV or if you're a current subscriber and you gift a subscription for a year, we're giving away signed theatrical posters of Som. This is the 10-year anniversary of the film that started all of this craziness. And I have a very limited number of original theatrical posters. These are full-sized, real posters used for the theatrical release, and I'm going to sign them. So if you sign up for Som TV or gift someone a subscription to Som TV, you will get a poster automatically. So I want to tell you right now, go to SomTV.com and subscribe. For the price of that alone, this poster is worth it, not counting the 550 incredible hours of original shows, educational content, all of that stuff. I am uh, very excited about this. We've been waiting a long time to announce. SomTV.com, get a signed Som poster from the theatrical release 10 years ago, and uh, enjoy all of our great content. On today's podcast, I am going to be talking about one of my all-time inspirations and idols, Robert Mondavi. I've brought in some of the greatest experts in the wine business, including Ray Isle, who's the executive uh, wine writer for Food & Wine Magazine, Kelly White, who uh, wrote the eponymous book Napa Valley Then and Now and is one of the great wine writers, in, the, in my opinion, in the history of wine. And uh, we're going to talk about Robert. Now, we've also pulled an interview with Robert himself, and I find him to be one of the most inspirational, dogmatic people that has ever entered the wine business. Let's listen to a little bit of just the way he talks about his mission in wine and why you have to believe in yourself. First, you have to have faith and confidence in yourself. You have to put your whole heart and soul into what you are doing and believe what you are doing and learn to excel. Do everything necessary. Look at your competition. What are they doing? Not only locally, look at it worldwide. I went throughout the world to find out what my competition was. And then I stopped at nothing to improve what we were doing. Now, many people, when they think of the name Mondavi, they think of what it is now. And what it is now is an enormous group of a very large family that have created many offshoots of what that name means. The Mondavi family goes back, geez, nearly 120 years, probably more, in the American wine business. But they're most famous from that name standpoint for the Robert Mondavi Winery, which is right there on Highway 29 in Napa. You can't miss it. It's got the giant spire. It's got the very large grass lawn. It sits on Tokolon Vineyard, which is one of the most famous American single vineyards that exists. And uh, the history is much greater than that. It goes back to pre-prohibition with the Krug Winery, and we're gonna get into that. But first, I wanted to ask Ray Isle, who has written for decades in wine, just what his first thoughts were when thinking about Robert himself. Robert Mondavi's mark on American wine is, if you want to call it a mark, it's indelible. He was a huge presence in American wine while he was alive, and he had a huge effect on making American wine, California wine, and particularly Napa Valley wine, respected and known on the world stage. And, you know, you can point to the Paris tasting as having a part of that effect, but that's a one-off event. Mondavi was very good at promoting the Mondavi winery, but he was very, very good at promoting as well or teaching people about the potential of what California could do in terms of wine. And it, he was pretty tireless about it. And he used his own winery and his own winery success as a platform to help the region as well. Now, before we get to Napa, we have to talk about Prohibition just a little bit. Now, Prohibition outlawed alcohol completely. I mean, it, it, it put a, a sort of ax in the wood as far as you're not allowed to drink or not allowed. But there were loopholes. And one of these incredible loopholes was that you were allowed to make wine at home. A lot of this is lost in history. You watch movies and things. Um, if you were making wine for church, religious stuff, or to make it at home, you could do it. Now, it's interesting to say that the Mandavi family, and this would go to Robert's parents, Cesare and Rosa, they were based in Minnesota, and this would have been in the 20s, in the height of Prohibition. And they realized something really interesting that people were still gonna drink. But there was a legal loophole that you could make wine at home. 
So they moved from Minnesota to Lodi, California. And Lodi now is known for having some very old vines, mostly Zinfandel, but Lodi is still a great winemaking region. They moved there and they started something called Simondavi and Sons Fruit Packing. And what they did is they sourced grapes, packed them up, and sent dehydrated grapes back all over the country. And they sold tons of it for home winemaking purposes, which was technically legal during Prohibition. And this is where the family realized there is money to be made in wine. And young Robert himself made a decision after Prohibition to go to school, not for winemaking, not for analogy, but for business. And his ambition starts to shine through right here. He's working for his dad, packing fruit, sending it all over the world, and he goes to Stanford in 1937 for economics. It was right at this time when Napa Valley became a real bullseye for his father. Now, Napa was, at the time, pretty open. You know, they grew walnuts, there were groves of different fruit trees. It was not what it looks like today. And so the Mandavi family turned their heads towards Napa as a place where you could buy cheap land. It looked like a great place to grow grapes. They could actually own their own grapes. And so they went to Napa. And here, let's listen to Robert Mandavi talk about the very first time he went to Napa Valley. My first trip in Napa Valley was in 1935 when my father came to Napa Valley, considering that he might invest money and be in the wine business. We liked it very much. And in 1937, my, dad, my father then bought property and became a partner uh, with Jack Riorta of the Sunny Hill Winery. And I then came in Napa Valley in 1937, and I've lived here ever since, and I've loved it. In the 1940s, there came an opportunity to buy one of the most iconic pre-prohibition wineries that exists, and still exists today. If you've ever gone to Napa and driven up the 29, or even just bought a bottle of Napa wine, you've probably heard of Charles Krug Winery. Charles Krug Winery was built in the mid-1800s by a German immigrant. And it is one of the most famous, oldest wineries in Napa, and the Mandavi family had a chance to buy it. Let's hear from Kelly White, who wrote Napa Valley Then and Now, to describe the significance of this winery. Charles Krug was the first commercial winery in Napa Valley. It opened in 1861. I think it's a beautiful fulfillment of destiny that a family as important as the Mandavis would then be the one to purchase it after Prohibition and kind of bring its reputation back to life. When Robert's father bought the Krug Winery in 1943, he set up his sons to be the winemakers. He trained them, he put them in the the cellar, and they learned everything there was to learn. And anybody who knows anything about wine knows that if you have two winemakers, you're gonna have some issues because wine is a very personal thing. And so over the course of the next, say, 15 years or so, Peter Mondavi and Robert Mondavi came to some disagreements about the way wine should be made, the way wine should be sold, how outwardly they should be pushing the brand. And in the early 60s, everything sort of came to a head. And you had Peter who was making wine, you had Robert who was making wine, but also kind of the outward facing person who was selling the wine. And uh, I'll let Ray Isle sort of explain where this came to, one of the great dramas of Napa. I mean, Robert Mondavi left Charles Krug Winery. He and his brother actually, like, came to blows in the, you know, fighting in front of the gateway of Charles Krug, which is about as iconic a moment as you get in family struggles. And out of that, he left and, in a way, kind of was like, fine, the hell with you. I'm founding my own winery, and it's going to be great. And he did that, and it was great. So it was very much like, I'm going to prove myself. It's incredible to think that post-Prohibition, no wineries were built and no brands were really made until Robert Mondavi started the Robert Mondavi Winery. Now, his first vintage was 1966. Prohibition ended in the 30s. So Robert Mondavi was part of one of the most incredible explosions in the wine business in America that ever happened. This goes back to the age of Jefferson in Virginia. This goes back to all of the wine in Los Angeles. This goes back any time period that you look at where wine was being looked at as a major profit center in a region. So with Mondavi, you have all of these wineries that started to pop up. Chapelet, Schramsberg was reclaimed, all of these great Napa wineries. But Mondavi was the first. 
And so he put himself out there with his name and started making wine. And he realized really quickly that he had to turn his head to a competition with Europe. And in true fashion of somebody who really wanted to succeed, he decided he would learn from them and work with them. Everybody said you couldn't produce wine in our valley belonging in the company of the great Bordeaux. So we made tremendous advances in winemaking, not only ourselves, but our competition. We're looking at one another and we're trying to outdo each other and we're having fun doing it. And each produced their own style, their own character, and then it's up to the individual because wine is a very personal thing. Robert was somebody who, he didn't just change the wine business, he changed wine. So you have to understand, his first vintage, 1966. Now, you can watch Kelly White open that bottle and into the bottle, our second Psalm film. And there's a reason we had that open, because it was such a, he could have lost everything if that did not work. And it worked. And that changed everything. But in 1968, he did something unthinkable. He grew Sauvignon Blanc in the Tocolon Vineyard. And Sauvignon Blanc was not something that Americans really thought about. It was not, this is not a wine that you'd go, give me a, bla- a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. Nowadays, that might be the case, but it certainly was not in the 60s. So what he did is he named it Fumé Blanc, and he aged it in oak, very much like they do on the left bank of Bordeaux. And Fumé Blanc became a synonym for oak age Sauvignon Blanc. It's a completely invented term that never existed before Mondavi. And all of a the sudden, these wines became world-class as a white wine. He had already conquered the Cabernet in 66. He had already done red. He did these whites. And I had a really unique opportunity. And you can see some of this in the rain verticals that we filmed on Psalm TV with uh, his grandson, Carlo Mondavi, where I got to drink a bunch of these bottles from the 70s and 80s. And I, I can't tell you how great they were. They were so structured the acid, everything was in balance. It's a, it's a very strange thing to talk uh, wine geekery, but when a wine holds up, it's, it speaks to a person's vision 20, 30, sometimes 50 years before. And Fumé Blanc is this American invention of how do I sell a wine, but how do I sell something that's of a real quality? And so he walked into Napa, created his own wine, and used his name and put his ass on the line for it. It's a tremendous thing. So I asked Ray, what what are the things lasting now that Robert Mondavi is known for today? Like the things that I could, you could just name off the top of your head that he influenced. Look at Napa Valley Vintners, you look at the Napa Valley Auction, you look at, you know, Mondavi sort of in terms of getting involved with Mouton Rothschild to create Opus One, and, and just kind of always being present as a voice saying, you know, California wine, and particularly the Napa Valley wine, is as good as any wine region on the planet. That really did have an effect, I think, at a time when, when that was not a given. You know, now you say California wine's really great. People are like, well, of course, duh. But when you get to the 70s, that wasn't a given. People were like, of course, French wine is greater than California wine. That's what they thought. It was, it was a big sort of upheaval of the wine world to, to put California on par with France. When Robert Mondavi launched his first vintage in 1966, he had no idea that 10 years later, an event was about to happen called the Judgment of Paris. Now, Mondavi's wines were not in this event, but all of the work he had done was part of why Napa was chosen by people like Patricia Gallagher and Stephen Spurrier to put on a world stage against the French. You have to understand, Mondavi, he pushed the all boats rise with a rising tide. So even if you were a competitor, he knew you needed to succeed in order for the region to succeed. This was an incredible, perfect storm that was happening in Napa. It's kind of like music in the 70s or movies in the 70s. Everything was kind of coming to a big head. And the Napa that exists today would not exist without the work Robert Mondavi did. The Judgment of Paris, Mondavi's work, and a lot of the winemakers that have been working since the 60s changed Napa forever. The entire place became a destination. The wines were found in restaurants for the first time, starting in California, moving out to the East Coast. And Mondavi, being a business person, decided it was a time for aggressive expansion. Robert Mondavi changed his entire ethos to try to get wine everywhere. And 
I'll let Rael explain kind of what the ramifications of this were. Now, we're talking about a, a nearly 18 to 20 year period. You know, he was an incredibly ambitious guy, and they grew and grew, and they started producing things like, you know, Madavi Coastal and Woodbridge and spreading out and trying to do millions of cases that got away from the kind of roots of being a high-end producer of Napa Valley Cabernet. And to effectively, to make that growth happen, they had to eventually go public. And they lost, I mean, essentially lost control of the winery. Um, you know, it got sold out from underneath them. Effectively, they were having financial problems. The board voted to sell the brand to Constellation. It always reminds me of Icarus. You know, it's, it's that hubris or ambition that you succeed and you, you make your wings and you fly and you, unfortunately, you affix the feathers with wax to yourself. You fly too close to the sun, the wings melt, the feathers fall off, and down you go. And it's ambition and hubris that causes Icarus to reach too far and, and fall. And there's a little bit of that in the Mandavi thing, too. It's like losing sight of your roots and trying to become too big and you lose control and it's taken away from you. Now, Icarus did not end up selling his failed wings for a billion bucks. So, you know, there is that. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like he just lost the winery and no one gave him any cash. And, you know, also by the time that happened, Madavi, I think, was 92. So it was the very end of his life. And so there was a long and, and extremely successful and distinguished career. This is one of the very first, or at least the most well-known American wine families post-prohibition that stepped in and said, we are going to do a multi-generational winery with our name on it. In Europe, you find that all over the place. You find Jean-Louis Chave. You find wines in the Northern Rhone, the Southern Rhone. You find wines in the Languedoc. You find wines in Germany. It's commonplace. You see multi-generations. With Mondavi, when they sold the winery to Treasury, it fragmented things, and the name was bought. You have a tremendous family that's now spread out across the Napa Valley and in Sonoma, making wines. And guess what? The family of Robert Mondavi's brother is still making wine at Krug. Thinking about the Robert Mondavi winery, it's the family aspect that still stands, and that's why that name is still important. It was the defining family winery of Napa Valley for such a strong period of time, and it became a brand, which is producing quite good wines and so on, and they certainly use Robert Mondavi as their iconic figure, but it's, it is a different structure and a different idea. It's a, it's a cautionary tale in a way, except that, you know, the family did well by it, and Tim Mondavi's making terrific wines up at Continuum, and Michael Mondavi's doing fine and has his own businesses. They had their struggles getting along as well, you know. I think they, they, they existed in different roles. Tim was a winemaker, and, and Michael was more business. But, you know, and now you've got the next generation down, and Carlo Mondavi is working with his brother. It's a complicated family, and families are complicated. You know, being in business with your family members is, it's not just the Mondavis. You can pick any number of wine families where everything has blown up because people didn't get along. It is a fascinating classic drama. You know, wine takes a long time to make. Vines themselves take three to seven years to even see any kind of meaningful harvest from, sometimes longer, depending on what you're trying to do. For them to build a name on top of the Krug Winery, and then for Robert to go out on his own and create the Robert Mondavi Winery, it's an incredibly inspiring story. And I, you know, I would say that Right now, everybody's sort of nervous about money and their lives and what they're going to do with their careers. And I, I sort of see this in every aspect of life. I think that you can look to people like Robert Mondavi and you can look to wine and grapes and vines as a whole as an inspiration. Because here's the thing. It takes a long time. And weathering the storm and figuring things out is part of winemaking. It just is. And the story of Mondavi is an incredible up and down, perfect storm into another storm, and then out with this incredible blossoming of the family being spread out and making wine all over. Now you drive into Napa, you see wineries that are worth, geez, tens of millions of dollars, 40 million, 100 million. I believe he's the only person that could have actually believed what it became today. And that's important for everybody who's thinking about, you know, some ambitious goal, whether you're trying to be a winemaker or something else. Robert Mondavi is one of the great American influential businessmen, and he did it in wine. And I think that the name Mondavi is the greatest gift that he gave, whether you drink the wine or not, it's something that is incredibly inspiring. Many of the classic California wine families had 
a lot of influence, but I'm not sure they had influence the same way Mandavi did because they weren't as public a figure. There was no question that his individual will to succeed and to promote Napa Valley made a huge difference. But it also, if he'd tried doing that in the 1950s, it would have been too early. And I don't think the, the U.S. was ready for that awareness to happen with California wine at that time. And if he, I mean, he started in the late 60s. If, he, if he'd started in the 80s, it would have been, it would have already been, the wheels would have already been turning and someone would have come in. So it's, there's, there's Mandavi, but there's also the broader picture of what was going on with wine in the United States and wine in California. And, you know, the, the other things like that are the Paris tasting and, and just kind of the interest in restaurants, interest in kind of the changing food tastes of the country, interest in wine as opposed to beer, milk, and, you know, and whiskey. It's hard to take those two things apart, the, the kind of broader cultural movement and the Mondavi effect on it. So they're very tied, but there's no question that the moment in history got the right guy at the right time, and Mondavi was the right guy for that moment, and it helped him, and it also helped California wine enormously. You have to have faith in yourself. You have to be willing to work hard. You have to be willing to take a gamble, but have faith in yourself. You'll have many naysayers will say, no, no, you can't do this again. Plow ahead. In this fine wine business, it's not going to take five years, not 10, it's going to take a lifetime. You know, I've listened to those last words from Mandavi many times. Uh, he is an incredibly inspirational person for me and my entire team. It's not just about Napa. It's not about business. It's not about wine. It's about really sticking to your goals and caring about what you're working on every day. Ten years ago, we made some, and all of you who are listening to this to the end, obviously, you've seen some. You're either a subscriber to Psalm TV or a listener to this podcast, and that means the world to us. That's why we wanted to open up the vault and pull out these theatrical posters. I'm going to sign every single one of them, so if you're not a subscriber, now's the time. Uh, SomTV.com, and if you are a subscriber, gift it to somebody who would appreciate it. It's really important that you help us spread the word because we work really hard on this, and I know that you listeners and you watchers love it. So get your posters, get them signed, go to SomTV.com. Today's episode was produced by John Adams. Thank you, John. And one last thing. Please give us a good review wherever you listen to this podcast, whether it's Apple or Spotify. It's really, really important. It helps us reach more listeners. And if you love this podcast, please give us a great review. All right, everybody, please be safe. Bye.